Hello and welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Before we get started tonight, I have a couple of announcements to make. One is uh, the show had sponsored a Boomer Sooner contest with a $50 prize for the best words to Boomer Sooner in an Indian language. Well, the deadline was August 1st, so now is when I would announce the winner, but we didn't have any entries, so I guess we'll try again next year. <laughs> now you all have a whole year to work on this, so get serious. Um, Second announcement is on October the 23rd, the Intertribal Wordpath Society will be sponsoring a celebration of Oklahoma Indian language and culture at the Cleveland County Fairground in Norman uh, from 6.30 to 11 p.m. And we'll, we'll make more uh, information available about this soon, but please mark your calendars now. We'll have storytellers, hymn singers, uh, traditional drummers, and a lot of activity, cultural activities all in Oklahoma Indian languages. Uh, final announcement is OU classes start this week, so um, I just wanted to mention uh, there may be a possibility of late enrollment. Uh, if you're interested in taking Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, or Kiowa, classes in all of these will be offered. Um, they're all, all except the Kiowa are offered at three levels. If you're beginning, you would take beginning one, and you could take, you would have your choice of those four languages. The Cherokee and the Creek are offered Tuesday and Thursday, 9 to 10, 15 a.m. Choctaw is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 2.30 to 3.20, and Kiowa is Tuesday and Thursday, 1.30 to 2.45. If you'd like to sign up, you can call the OU Registrar at 325-4621. We'll give the number at the end of the program as well. That's 325-4621. Or the Evening Students Office, if you're just taking the one course, that's a good way to go. And the extension there is uh, 4028-325-4028. All right, now I'd like to introduce my guest for tonight, uh, who is my friend Pauline Wapipa. Uh, Pauline is an absentee Shawnee tribal member, an educator. Uh, she's a member of the board of directors of the Intertribal Word Path Society, and she teaches the Shawnee language. So welcome, Pauline. Thank you. Glad to have you. Um, let's get a little bit of personal history first. Could you tell us, you know, where you were born and uh, uh, what languages you spoke as you were growing up and so forth? Okay, I was um, I was born uh, uh, west of uh, Tecumseh. Tecumseh is the nearest town where I was born, mm -hmm. and uh, my first language was Ab uh, Shawnee. Mm -hmm. And then my mother uh, passed away when I was two, and and her uh, aunt uh, raised me, mm -hmm. and uh, she was Shawnee, and she was married to a, a Kickapoo man. Mm -hmm. and that's where I learned the Kickapoo. Mm. So I learned absentee Shawnee and Kickapoo language. Mm. And from my cousins, I learned uh, English. Mm. So you grew up with three languages. Yes, I grew up with three really, languages. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, what happened? What about education? Well, I started out at public school, then I, then I ended up in um, uh, BIA boarding schools. Mm -hmm. I started at Pawnee Indian School, then I went to Riverside, mm -hmm. and from Riverside I went to Haskell Institute at the time, mm -hmm. and from there I went to Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm. And you're saying you got married while you were out in California? Yeah, I, I met my husband, and he was from Oklahoma, and mm -hmm. everybody jokes about it. <laughs> <laughs> you had to go to California to <laughs> meet an Oklahoma to marry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you were telling me... Um, that you kind of, uh, well, when you came back to Oklahoma, you were kind of rusty at your Indian languages at that point, right? Yeah, yes, I didn't realize I was. Uh, we were married for about a year, and then we decided to move back after my son was born. And, um, and uh, I met his family, and his mother didn't speak a word of English. Mm. And um, I tried to converse with her, and communicate with her, but I couldn't do it. I just stumbled mm. around and mm. stammered. I just couldn't do it. She was speaking Kickapoo? She only spoke Kickapoo. Mm. By the way, how close are, I know the linguists say that Kickapoo and Shawnee are related to each other. How close are they? If, if you speak one, can you sort of understand the other, or are they really quite separate? Well, they are similar. There are uh -huh. some words that are, are the same, uh -huh. and, um, and they're part of the Algonquin mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. stock, I guess you'd call it stock. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, now you have a pretty extensive uh, history of teaching too, which I'd like to 
talk a little bit about um, early on you were teaching English to Kickapoo children, right? Yes, uh, I worked at this bilingual uh, program at Choctaw and we were teaching uh, the Kickapoo children uh, in reading and in English. Hmm. And so I, ta I taught them English through, through Kickapoo. I'd hmm. translate English to Kickapoo. Now were these children that um, they came from home, homes where only Kickapoo was spoken? Yes. So English yes. was a foreign language to them, right? Well, pretty much. I mean, it was all around them. I mean, they probably heard it. They just didn't uh -huh. speak it. Oh. I think that's so interesting. We're always talking about teaching Indian languages to people who speak English, but the opposite still, there is still a need in some communities for mm. teaching children English. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think Kickapoo's may be the only community I know of where there's much of a need for that these days because there still are children that grow up with Kickapoo as their first language, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's neat. And then you said you'd also taught adults. Right? Uh, yeah, at the same project, I, uh -huh. I uh, we had uh, night classes for the adults, and we was teaching English to the adults, mm. the Kickapoo uh, adults. Mm. And it was actually after that that you then started taking classes in bilingual education, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was kind of strange. Uh, there, there was a bilingual classes at the uh, University of Central Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I took those classes at that night. Mm -hmm. Then uh, mm. that was after the, the so you, you program. So you learned by experience first, and then you learned what the academic world had to say about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you find that uh, even though you had already been a bilingual teacher, that, that these courses had something to offer you? Did it help you, uh, give you ideas about how to teach? Yeah, it gave me several ideas of how to teach, because uh, mm -hmm. there were, they were classes on uh, the immersion and the uh, um, the rote, I guess. Mm -hmm. Various different teaching uh, methods. Uh -huh. Different teaching methods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and you you did participate in this uh, Onaldi workshop one summer, didn't you? That was the Oklahoma Native American Language Development Institute, which was also at UCO. Yeah. Well, actually, is that I, part I of the classes you're talking about? No. Oh, well, they're all kind of the same. Mm -hmm. But I went two summers. Oh, two summers, okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, at the end of all of this uh, education, <laughs> educational approach to teaching, you, you have an MA in education now, right? Yes, I have. <clears throat> um, now, I think it's interesting that you taught both kids and adults. I mean, we're talking about teaching English to Indian people, but I think teaching a language is pretty much the same principles are involved, techniques and so forth. A lot of people make a big deal out of how differently children learn from adults. Did you find that to be true? Yes, the children learn faster, quicker. Yeah. So yeah. you had to give the adults a little extra <laughs> support? <or? laughs> a little more rote. <laughs> what were some yeah. of the methods you used in those classes? Well, <laughs> it was more trans translation type. Mm -hmm. I tell them, you know, what With I, the adults? With the adults, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. And then we played bingo with the with the English words, mm -hmm. and we'd translate the English into Kickapoo, mm -hmm. you know, just by saying, yeah. this is how you say hat in English. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm a great fan of bingo as a, as a teaching <laughs> method myself. <laughs> I use it in Comanche classes, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a good way to make a little game out of learning your numbers. It just makes it that much easier, I uh -huh. think. Um, now, also, another kind of teaching that I understand you've done was that you were um, I don't know if they call it a consultant or a resource person for a field methods course, a, a linguistic field methods course at OU. Right? Yes, I did that back. one summer. What was that like? I mean, what, it was in the spring. <laughs> the spring semester. It was, it was kind of fun. It was interesting. Now, this was Shawnee language? It was or? Shawnee language, yes. Uh -huh. I got permission from my, uh, my business committee to do this. Mm -hmm. How many students did you have? I think we had about six, six oh, or well, eight. That's a nice size class. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people may not know what field methods is. I know <clears throat> as a linguistics graduate student, it's a course I took several times because I used to just love that, that instead of learning, just doing some linguistic theory or, or working on problems in a book or something, you actually sit down in a room with a native speaker uh -huh. of a language that you don't speak. Uh -huh. And the idea is to teach the students how to ask questions and how to investigate a language and figure out for themselves what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I guess you got asked a lot of questions in that class, right? Yeah. <laughs> I had to translate a lot of sentences. Mm -hmm. Did it was it helpful to you in any way? It was helpful for me to remember uh, my uh -huh. my Shawnee language. Uh -huh. 
Well, that's good. Um, now, I, actually, I was talking to Margaret <clears throat> Malden the other day, and uh, she was saying what a good guest you'd be on the program. And she, she mentioned that you had been a substitute teacher for her once when she couldn't make it to her Creek class at OU. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> she said the students really liked what you did with them with this, uh, making this book. Could you describe what that activity was like? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we'd, uh, I had them to draw pictures, you know, uh -huh. on a page of, for themselves. And I had them to write a sentence in English and then translate it to the, to the Creek and mm -hmm. to use their dictionaries. I think they had dictionaries. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and put the Creek words under their pictures. And then I think there was 19 students and then they, we put all their pages together with their artwork and mm -hmm. made a little book out mm -hmm. of it. So each student drew their own picture and came up with their own sentence and put it in English and in Creek. And then you made a, a class book out of uh -huh. But we put there. the Creek first and the English okay. second. Well, that makes sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> yeah, quick first and then the English translation. Yeah, the English translation, yes. <clears throat> um, and we made copies for each student. I mean, oh, I, that's I good. had Margaret had to do that. I really like teaching materials like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times um, <clears throat> people will complain that there aren't enough materials available to teach Indian languages, and uh -huh. that can be a problem, but the good side of it is you can make your own, and if you make your own, it's more personal. You know, if, uh -huh. if a student has drawn a picture and written that sentence on there, uh -huh. I don't think they'll ever forget it because it's very personal to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's a neat, neat kind of activity to do. Well, now, are you teaching Shawnee now? Yes, I am. Well, what's the setting there? Is this a community class or? What? Well, we was trying to set it up as a community class, but you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've been having problems in, on a, a permanent site. Oh, a meeting place? Mm -hmm, meeting mm -hmm. place. But um, we're working on I think we got one established now. Good. How many students do you have or do you expect to have? Well, it varies. I, <coughs> the most I had was, was um, one family, and then there were about seven in that family. Mm. That's neat and, when a whole family's learning uh -huh, together. Yeah. Because then they can talk to each other, right? Uh -huh. Practice on each other. Yeah, and I'd rather have it that way, have the adults and the, bring their children to learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you've certainly approached language in a lot of different ways. I mean, in, in education, you know, and you've taken all these courses and the different methods. Mm -hmm. What do you kind of, um, what do you think are the best methods or the worst methods? Or what, what, I mean, can you kind of sum that up and say what, do you have your own approach that you've put together from all this of how you would teach well, language? Well, uh, I try the approach on the using everything, the, uh, yeah. the uh, feel, you know, to write it. Than uh -huh. a hearing, a lot of uh -huh. senses, you know, oh, uh -huh. uh, and to to see, to speak it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only, it the only thing left out is the taste. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what language tastes like, but <laughs> I guess you know when you speak it. <laughs> it's in your mouth, after all. Yeah. <laughs> but so I don't know if they call that holistic. To me, it sounds kind of like a holistic Probably. approach. It's, kind I of, think it's what it is. Kind of get at the language from a lot uh -huh. of different angles mm -hmm. at once. Well, some people, you know, learn through hearing. It's auditory. Uh -huh. And some people have, you know, through viewing, seeing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's some people like me who have to write it and see it and hear it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm that so way that, too. That's the way, I, that's that way. That's way I'm trying to teach it. Right, right. Um, have you ever tried language immersion, just using no English at all? Yeah, I've tried it. How did it but, I, but I haven't uh, getting in, didn't get into it too well. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I think this is great. Um, You've brought some materials with you. You want to show some of these and tell us uh, where you use these materials and how you develop them and everything? Well, whenever I get the students high enough <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. in their language, I, I want them to learn to read my little books that I made. Uh -huh. And uh, this one is about an apple. You can uh -huh. you know, see for yourself it's about an apple. Uh -huh. It's an apple-shaped paper. I think apple that's really shaped. cute. <laughs> you want me to take it in, maybe? Yeah. It, it's an accord. It's, it's called an accordion book. Where do I grab on now? Uh -huh. Here we go. Okay, it's like an accordion book. Uh -huh. So eventually so, they get uh -huh. all these pages, and each page has uh -huh. uh, this one. This one on here one talks about a, an apple. Uh -huh. And over here is talking about the seeds and how you plant them, uh -huh. and then the different colors. Some are yellow, some are oh. are green, uh -huh. and then. 
Really? When you talk about the yellow apples, you have a yellow page and a green uh -huh. page for the uh -huh. green apples. So yeah. I, I see you're doing that, all the senses at once, and the uh -huh. written and the sound. And yeah. I guess you read it out loud, too. I read probably. it out loud for them to hear. That is neat. It's so cute. You just made this yourself? Just yeah, I made this your own myself. Hands? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's great. It's really cute, too. Okay. And this one here, it was a group project. And, uh, you want to pick yeah. that in? So it starts. Now these are. It starts uh, at this. These end. are in Shawnee, right? Yes, it's in Shawnee. This starts here, uh -huh. and uh, then it uh, turn it around. Let me have that in. Oh, I see more pages on the and back, it, and it ends up over there. Uh -huh. Oh, that's the front, but ends up here. Ends up there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. And that, these are the people that put the and, book together. Yeah. You, you want to tell us? Uh, yeah, it was it was Jan Niosh, uh -huh. Mary Haney. And myself, mm -hmm. and Mary Haney did the pictures, and they, they're really cute pictures. I and I, I did the words, and, and Jan helped color, and uh -huh. and uh, it's just really cute. I bet the students have really enjoyed these. They do. And they, I see you have all sorts like of really talking animals in uh -huh. there. It's, it's really cute. Uh, I think that's it's great. basically asking each animal if they, he could go out to play. Oh, uh huh. And at the end here, he asked the turtle. To go out in the plane, so they're out there playing stickball. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> Have you ever thought this? of having these uh, mass produced in some way, actually, you know, published by a publisher? Yeah, I've been uh, been wanting to, but I I need uh, advice on how to do it. <laughs> yeah. Seems like they should be. They're just mm -hmm. so cute. Mm -hmm. and, and this one here is is uh, mostly English, and then we throw in a Shawnee word. Mm -hmm. Let's see this first one here. One day we went to visit our, how do you pronounce that? Kukuch. When we got there, she said, I already baked bread, and now? Oh, uh, now? <laughs> oh. Ki, ki hula thapatami. We're going to boil corn. Oh, oh. So on each page, you have like that, that you kind of say a lot in English, and then you fill in some uh -huh. just in Shawnee language? Uh -huh. Mostly it's, it's the few words. Oh. So we're introducing Shawnee this way. Uh huh. Just a little bit at a time. A little so bit at a time. Did you do this too? The, I mean, what about the artwork and all that? Yes, I did this. You're, you're just so resourceful. <laughs> I think it's great, Pauline. I don't, I and you have uh, this is several pages long, right? Yeah, just a few pages. Oh, uh huh. Hmm. So then, when you do, you, when you first show this to the students, do you just read it out loud to them? Yes, I, I read it out loud after we've been through several lessons, uh -huh. and I start reading the, the books to them. And then at some point, did they read it themselves, or how do, how do you? Well, I haven't gotten to any point yet to for them to do anything, but I want point. them to make their own books when we oh, get to yeah. some. Oh yeah, I think that's great because mm -hmm. it's very personal to them. Yeah, them. yeah. Mm -hmm. They can each write the story that they want to tell. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much what I did in that uh, class for uh, Margaret Malden. Mm -hmm. That's how yeah. I want to do it. Well, I think that's great. It's just so resourceful, and you know. So what if there aren't a lot of published books on how to teach Shoni? You just make your own, and then you get the students to make their own. I think yeah. it's a great way to go. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good. I, I admire you to be able to do that, and, <laughs> and your co-authors on that one with the animals, too. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the, role in, uh, the role of the individual in language teaching or language preservation work. Um, You've taught in different settings, informally with this family you talked about, and then in the university, and in the schools teaching English to the Kickapoos, and the bilingual program. There are all these different settings and different ways to do it, and yet, you know, you, the individual teacher, of course, you're the same, no uh -huh. matter where you're teaching, but you have something you can say to us about the, the role of the individual versus the institution or the school or formal classes and informal classes? Well, to me, the individual is um, more informal, and it's one one on one, mm -hmm. and uh, and you get to be more open on how you're gonna uh, teach. It's a more flexible, uh, type. a lot more flexible. Um, if you had, you know, if you could just wave a magic wand, and you know, let's say there were twenty Shawnee kids that wanted to learn Shawnee. If it was all up to you, what kind of setting, would you teach them all one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time, or would you have some have classroom to, uh, activities and some individual? It'd have you? to be a 
classroom setting with the was that many I guess a little maybe 15 minutes of this and uh -huh. another 15 minutes with mm -hmm. that one class I uh, I uh, went through the the um, the alphabet that that we made up and uh, then I would teach them about 10 words mm -hmm. and we'd go over them you know several times and then that go into making short sentences with the words mm -hmm. that we learned that day mm -hmm. So it's about the three Sounds three good. things that I do in a class. Yeah, and I, I I remember it was a while back, but I saw you present some of these materials at a conference once out at Preston. Uh -huh. And am, am I remembering right that you had like little uh, cards, alphabet cards with the word that illustrated each letter? I had a big book, I think it was. Oh, okay. And it had had the A. Uh huh. You know all the letters that I hear in Shawnee. Uh huh. So basically, you you devised your own system for writing the language, or well, with the help with with the people there at Old Naldi, we we developed the yeah. uh, good for you. alphabet. That's great. Mm -hmm. And do other people use this system now, or have you have you seen uh, other people write Shawnee words in that yes, way? Yes, based yes, on your instruction? Uh -huh. yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. Okay, I had one. Uh, we're running a little short on time now, but I had one other topic I wanted to bring up with you. We haven't talked a lot of Shawnee language or Kickapoo language tonight, and, and part of that has been on purpose because I'm trying to be sensitive to what, what I've heard of those two communities, uh -huh. the Absentee Shawnee Tribe and the Kickapoo, that they really are not um, eager to share their language with the general public. Can you kind of um, explain that point of view or why it is? <laughs> well, to me, I feel like it's just kind of hi history-based. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Kickapoos and the Shawnees were always at war with with the with the um, I guess Americans the first Amer I'm not the first Americans we're mm. the first Americans <laughs> but uh, the intruding American <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people that uh, first came here mm -hmm. and we was you know always at war with them and mm -hmm. continuously until we got to Oklahoma I guess you might say mm -hmm. and then um, so it just there was just more. Uh, I, I can't explain. Just don't want to share. Mm -hmm. They're a little afraid of sharing their language. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know to uh, that it might be analyzed and mm -hmm. and you know. Mm -hmm. But to, I uh, I want to say sacred. It's sacred to them. Mm -hmm. And kind of sharing is kind of hard for them. Hmm. Yeah, I have heard this about both of those communities that they are very kind of conservative about sharing the language with mm -hmm. outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's occurred to me that at least among the Kickapoo, they do still have households which speak mainly Kickapoo, right? Yes. So this true. has really served the community well, I would think. Um, yes. They, to they, hold on to the language that tightly does does mean that your children still grow up with it, mm -hmm. and even though it's a small community, it hasn't been washed out. By English at all, has it? Y yes, they I think it probably has a pretty strong future if they can hold on to that. Mm -hmm. But what about among the absentee Shawnee? Is is it? I think something you said before kind of led me to think that there are more absentee Shawnee children that are growing up with just English now. Is that true? Yes, I've I've been noticing that there's there's mm -hmm. some families that aren't passing on the language. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm concerned and I'm mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. But of course, the the absentee Shawnees have not. Uh, had classes in the public schools, partly because of this kind of wanting to keep the language private. Yes. Do you, do you think that that well, maybe might change, or is that being considered? May change in a uh, few more years. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to bring up the issue because I think it's part of the whole. We try to <laughs> kind of give the picture of what goes on with Indian languages in Oklahoma, and it's an issue we never talked about before. And uh -huh. I kind of wanted to have a representative of each each tribe come on the program, and then I thought, well. What do you do if a tribe doesn't want to share their language, you know? <laughs> <laughs> have an empty chair? I mean, I <laughs> you certainly have lots of interesting things to say, and I think your teaching methods and your materials are just wonderful. I'm really glad that you shared them with us. Uh, but I, I wanted to kind of bring up that issue a little bit, just because, you know, it's, it's something a little different. Most tribes are not as conservative about sharing as those two tribes are, and you happen to, those are your two tribes, so to speak, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the two languages mm -hmm. that, that you speak. So I just wanted to kind of, get that out there that that's another as another aspect to what goes on with Indian languages in Oklahoma and actually the like I was saying I think in the case of the Kickapoos it seems to have served as a language preservation tool itself this 
holding on to the language so tightly. Mm -hmm. And to, and of course to the culture too, I think it all goes together, I think. Yes. Isn't it true that Kickapoo people are, are much more traditional culturally than, yeah. than a lot of other tribes at yes, least? Yes, they are. Yeah. Well, I think that's awfully interesting. Um, I guess uh, we're almost out of time, so I just want to thank you again for being here. I hope you do find a publisher for your materials. I think they definitely <laughs> deserve to be published, and uh, every Shawnee kid should have them. <laughs> I think that would be I great. So. I'd like to see them in all the living rooms around <laughs> the land. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you again, Polly. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, join us next time on WordPath. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita.